Okay, are we ready to do this? It looks like we are. It looks like we are streaming. And with that, we'll say good morning from Riverton. Um, first of all, um, <clears throat> you may notice it's a different camera. And we haven't done videos in a long time. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. But um, you may notice that the camera angle is a little different this time. You're seeing a little more panorama than you normally see. Uh, that's because the uh, desktop that normally runs the streaming has been pretty much on the blink quite a bit lately. And um, it is probably on its last days. <laughs> it's probably on its way out. And um, I I don't know what what the uh, what the problem is. So we have no stream deck today. We have no um, nothing. Um, I'm using an ASUS ZenBook uh, computer, which is a neat little uh, laptop that has a second screen. I haven't had a chance to fully uh, utilize that second screen yet, but um, it's some pretty neat stuff. So you, I guess you could say we are. We're 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 in the RPU today. We're 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 using the we're using the remote pickup uh, today instead of the uh, instead of the main studio to broadcast. So, um, if that analogy works, um, we'll go with it. Um, I know a lot of folks, uh, you know, have been wondering where the heck Michi has been, and um, honestly, I I I kind of question that. Uh, myself, and uh, yeah, where has the Michi been? Where, where, what have I been doing? And I'll tell you. Um, first of all, there's a there's been a lot going on right now in the life of the Michi, both in um, uh, with uh, family issues, um, home repair issues. Um, we've been dealing with um, various things. Um, fortunately, neither Eva nor myself have gotten COVID, so that's a, a good sign. And, um, I think we've done a pretty good job at, um, trying to avoid that situation. Fortunately, when you live out in a place like, out here, like in Riverton, where you're, you know, really, you know, 15 to 20 miles from the nearest civilization, um, you really don't get out that much, so... That's pretty much uh, what's been going on there. Also, we've been working on uh, quite a few things. Quite a, quite a few projects have just been coming in back to back to back to back. And I'm only one person and there's only 24 hours in a day. And I need to sleep during some of that time. And, um, you know, we, we went through the NCE window, the NCE window aftermath. We had a little bit of a break in there. And then we started to get into some ELMS projects that had to do with uh, new functionality that the FCC was putting into LMS. We had to make sure that we supported that. And <clears throat> then it went into regulatory lockdowns. Um, we had one uh, a while back for the uh, geotargeted boosters. And now with this latest one that we have, which was for the Franken FM proceeding, the FM6 proceeding, the MB docket 03185. And, um, you know, so during this time, I've been very late on things. I've been not able to get back to everybody that I should be getting back to. And um, I don't want, I just want to say this publicly to the world, I don't want people to think that I'm ghosting them because it's, it's just been crazy and um you know i'm i'm just wait you know it's just been way too busy and um you know and this this also explains why i have not been able to um do any kind of uh, uh podcasts or anything like that you know it, it takes it takes a lot of time to do um even when we you know during you know FCC today to to do FCC today the podcast maybe a an eight or ten minute program 
you're spending at least an hour or so compiling and writing and then recording. And actually, it's the compiling and writing. It's the show prep that takes so much longer than the actual recording. Thanks to, you know, software, it, you know, I mean, we could record the pieces and then just, uh, and just move them around, edit them, add the jingles, and there you go. You've got it. So with that said, um, obviously, I've not been able to get through to a lot of people lately, and um, responses are slow. I'm in the process of catching up. Um, we are now kind of out of this regulatory lockdown. We'll probably be in a mini lockdown just prior to August 1st which is the reply comment dates in this proceeding. Now, first of all, let's talk about MB Docket 03185. Comments closed on it yesterday. Reply comments are due on August 1st. And um, um, the they've actually the fcc is actually tackling three issues right now three kind of interrelated issues the big issue of course is what to do with the fm6 operations most of you call them franken fms obviously you know the the industry considers that a pejorative um so you know we kind of use more of the term uh, fm6 than we do franken fm although i will use the two terms interchangeably uh depending on what kind of mood i'm in so um, we have uh, uh, the, the Franken FMs. There's currently right now there are 13 uh, Channel 6 LP TV stations that have been operating under special temporary authority since the analog shutdown that happened, what, last year or so. And they've been running under these uh, STAs with these interesting conditions on them, and uh, pretty much um, they're having to run um, their uh, you know what what these the way these stations are working now is that what they do is they take a six megahertz wide TV channel, and then what they do is they chop off the last 500 kilohertz. So basically about a five point, and then what they do is they take, they have about a, a 5.5 megahertz wide digital video signal. So they basically, they chop off the last 500 or, or so. I think, you know, I mean, I've seen it on the spectrum analyzer. So yeah, it, it, it is about, it is about a 500 kilohertz um, allotment that is used for the audio signal. So um, the FCC requires them to run in the ATSC3 um, protocol and also to um, that they have to run some kind of full-time video service of some kind. And then they run, you know, then they can run their analog. Uh, they can't modify their facilities. They can't transfer or assign their facilities to another, um, to another entity. So basically, they're stuck. Um, you know, they're stuck in their current positions, and um, the FCC is not accepting any more um, STAs for new FM6 stations. A couple have tried. A couple have tried, and uh, they've been turned away. So that's the state of that. So the bottom, you know, so you look at these FM6 stations. And you look at the comments, because we've already seen the comments from the FM6 lobby have already been filed. And, you know, they go on and on and on about the great um, uh, programming that's on um, that's on these on these uh, FM carriers. You know, they've got uh, they've got the Guadalupe radio in uh, Los Angeles, which is a Spanish Catholic format. Um, there's a, a Fairfax, Virginia, I believe. There's a, a Spanish uh, format there. In New York City, it is a Korean format. Um, in um, Chicago, it's MeTV FM. 
and they're running the uh, you know the, the the baby boomer format. So I guess I guess boomers are now a, uh, a, a, a I mean okay I I will allow it I will totally allow it yeah boomers boomers are a um are 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 running you know are are doing um you know are you know is is is, is diverse group now whether they're underrepresented in radio. That's hard to say. I mean, come on. Tune into any uh any talk station on AM and um never mind. <laughs> so, they're wanting to keep these stations. They're wanting rules codified. They're wanting some rules to basically, you know, seal the deal that, you know, these stations um should be allowed to stay and continue to do you know what they're doing you know they they tout about how much their um audio services are really serving the public interest but they're never talking about what their video services are doing what exactly are the franken fms doing on their video well you know they never talk about it Basically, you have to find out from people in the communities or you have to find out through um, websites like rabbitears.com or um, <clears throat> or through um, or through their STA filings. Um, you know, the station that's in Los Angeles, uh, KZNO, they're running, uh, you know, they're running the they're running the Guadalupe radio on on the a on the fm on an overpowered uh 3kw facility from the top of mount wilson where a, a regular class b without grandfathering would only need to would only be allowed about 880 watts so yeah they're running you know quite a bit of power up there and um they're in their latest sta filing to extend their sta they're 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 very niche, very public interest <clears throat> video service. They're, you know, is jewelry TV, home shopping, and I'm pretty sure that all the other Frankies are the same way. That they're all running uh, like a jewelry TV or some kind of uh, home shopping club kind of uh, channel or something. Um, you know, to me, it's still a waste. Of, um, as NPR put it, twenty nine uh ninety six percent of a TV channel. So you know they run this nothing TV service just so they can run their their FM. They're putting ninety nine percent of their effort into the FM and nothing into the TV. Also, too, um, TV, um, the you know low band. Who is you know who is watching low band and this is um you know you in order to watch a low band tv station especially in digital you need a big antenna you need an antenna with the right elements um to uh you know to make sure that you're able to pick up the station and uh, this is why most of the um uh, network affiliates and most of the major stations in major markets are no longer in the low band with the sole you know, with 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 the exception called out for our friends and i say our friends because we've been on we've been on different sides of the wall on, on in the past our our beautiful friends at WPVI in Philadelphia this is a shout out to you ABC Disney and WPVI is one of those stations they are they are the squeaky wheel of Channel 6. Um, when representing the full power TV stations, they are the squeakiest wheel. They're actually because they're actually the biggest Channel 6 station in the country. They're running the most power. They're on an STA to increase, um, trying to get it, um, trying to get that granted as a permanent um, a licensed facility. And, you know, they're having a very difficult time right now. They're having a very difficult time um, uh, with uh, reception issues because everybody else is on high band in UHF. They've got the smaller antennas. They're able actually able to pick up the station. 
there's, you know, the other stations. And, you know, this is a problem that goes back to the days of the network state, uh, the network O&Os back in the original digital transition. The, all the network owned and operated stations figured, OK, we're going to stay in VHF. You know, it's kind of like that line from uh, from the uh, Weird Al Yankovic movie uh, UHF, where he says, "You know, we are Channel Eight is a VHF station. We don't compete with UHF stations." <laughs> it's kind of along the same lines here, and um, that's pretty much uh, uh, where we're at there. So, you know, REC's position is on this issue is, is that the um, FM6, Franken FMs, they need to be sunsetted. Just, let's just sunset these stations. Um, and we do it in coordination with Wide FM, with the implementation of Wide FM, the expansion of the FM broadcast band down to 76. Because these um, stations are, are secondary. They get no primary protection. However, because of their unique dial position, they're on channel six. Um, channel six and channel five stations do enjoy this kind of quasi primary status. Um, the low power TV stations do, um, because of the channel gaps between channel four and five and the big channel gap between, um, six and uh, seven, they don't have to worry about certain adjacent channels, second adjacent um, issues. They only have to worry about channel five stations. And right now, nobody is moving. There's not this big rush to go to low band by the full power stations. You know, there was all this talk on the Internet. And, you know, and then so many people have always said to me, you know, uh, you know, when ATSC three comes out. Um, suddenly everybody's going to be flocking to low band. That's not going to happen. It hasn't happened. If it was, if it was going to happen, why do we have TV stations? We have mainly Gray and Sinclair owned stations that are filing petitions for rulemaking to move off of VH, low VHF and even high VHF and onto UHF. Um, there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of exodus um, from the low band spectrum, and including channels five and six. I mean, when we started all this a long time ago, I mean, up until what a couple of years ago, we had uh, ten stations on channel six. Um, we're currently right now this moment at nine. And then um, we have um, the, the one in uh, Billings, Montana. I think it's KTVM. Uh, they have uh, a granted uh, petition for rulemaking and a construction permit to move to UHF. So they're in the process of moving. So we'll be down to eight Channel 6 stations, full service stations across the country. And once the dust settles... We'll be down to, I think, 15, 15 um, full service facilities on Channel 5. So obviously the spectrum is not being used much by primary stations. Exactly. Nine is not many. Neither is 15. There's got to be a better use for the band. And, um, you know, but, you know, if we, you know, let's, first of all, I'm I'm working on uh, we're working. Uh, we're work not working on our normal thing. So my the stream deck is down. So I don't have my easy button pushing. Uh, the laptop only has one USB port, which I've chosen to use the uh, uh, the Rodecaster sound instead of um, uh, instead of the um, built-in mic. I am using the built-in uh, PC uh, uh, laptop camera. So that's why the angle is different and everything. Um, you know, there, you know, so he's saying there is a path to um, uh, from Channel 6 to UHF then. Yeah. Yes, there is. There is definitely a path. The problems that you're going to face, um, what we found, you know, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the Maverick research that's been done by the REC labs, um, I guess, you know, I've narrowed it down to three possible reasons why stations have not moved off of channels five and six. Um, in in some cases, like, for example, in Philadelphia, it's definitely spectrum availability. Um, if, um, 
if um, they were able to, uh, you know, if, if, if WPVI was able to change Alpha Channel 6, I'm pretty sure they would have done it by now. I'm definitely pretty sure they would have they would have been able to change off of channel six if they could by now, just to deal with a lot of these problems. Now um, we'll see what happens um, with next gen. Um, you know, W. You know, I I don't see WPVI switching their channel six facility to ATSC three, and then um, putting their ATSC one on a channel share. Uh, somewhere in the market, I don't see them doing that. I don't see, you know, anybody going to ATSC three um, other than the Elp, than the Franken FMs. Currently, right now, there's um, uh, last count, I think there was 16 uh, TV stations in the VHF low band, and that's channel that's RF channels two through six. Um, of them, all but one are on channel six. One's on channel two. And they're all low-power TV stations. No full-service stations are running ATSC3 in the low band. And, you know, when you think about it, you know, the world has pretty much abandoned the low band. Um, you know, that is... the Low VHF was, you know, when the rest of the world, except for North America converted to a digital terrestrial television. That's what the DTT, you'll, you'll hear me sometimes use the term DTT. That's what DTT stands for is uh, digital terrestrial TV. And I know we're having some dropouts and I apologize. Um, again, we're working off of new equipment that's never been used before for this purpose. And we're also working off a Wi-Fi connection, which can be a little sketchy sometimes, even though the the router's right downstairs. We've, we've got the sketchiest Wi-Fi in this place. Um, anyway, most of the world has abandoned um, low VHF for DTT because simply it, there's, 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 there's better pastures. Also, too, you got to also, in all fairness, um, the way most of the rest of the world does television is very different than, the, than our structure here in America where we have zillions of stations, they operate. And a lot of times what they do, a lot of these other countries, is one company runs the infrastructure. They run the transmitters and everything like that. And then the regulator, they're not necessarily, I mean, yeah, they are, reg, you know, they are approving the transmission sites, but they are separately approving the, the program providers, the content providers. And that's how they do it. And, and that's how a lot of countries do it. And they're able to channel share and mucks together and all that stuff. And, you know, a, a much more efficient method of, um, of spectrum. The closest thing we have right now is the, uh, is the ATSC one channel sharing that's going on in some of the next gen markets right now um, where, um, you know, TV stations are, um, simulcasting their ATSC1 services on uh, on another TV station as a multicast channel. And that's that's how um that's the closest thing that we'll have because everybody wants to be a part of it. Um what about WNYW TV5 in uh New York City? Now WNYW I believe is the um um, is the uh, VHF, I mean, is the, uh, is that's the, I believe that is the legacy calls uh, for, uh, uh, well, I mean, that's the call sign for what was, you know, for what is uh, supposed to be Fox 5, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm not from the New York market, but I'm pretty sure that's, that's, um, let me see, WNYW, that is, uh, Trying to do this in a way, okay. WNYW, yeah, that is that's the that's the big Fox affiliate in New York City. Um, they're actually on UHF channel twenty seven. This is another thing to realize: is that just because a station says over the air they're on channel five, that doesn't mean that they're on RF channel five. They could be in UHF. The channel numbers that you see on TV now are virtual channel numbers, and this was a nice feature. Um, called PSIP, P -S -I -P, 
that allowed um, stations to keep their original channel number identities yet move to another part of the band. It, just, it, made, it made things in the digital transition a lot easier many years ago. Um, now, as we point out, only North America is using low VHF for DTT. Um, every other country in the world has abandoned it. Only the United States, Canada, Mexico, and um, we've also found, uh, based on an international agreement that I ran into, um, we also found out that the Caribbean islands of uh, St. Martin, that's on the Dutch side, and uh, Curacao are using, um, are, are using uh, uh, channels five or six for um, digital television. Everybody else has moved their digital TV to mostly mostly to UHF. Some have gone into the low into the high VHF spectrum also. Um, Japan, their TV channels like one through three or so were started. Their TV actually started at ninety, and worked its way up to one hundred eight. And that's what Japan and and Japan had their radio in the seventy six to ninety band pretty much where channel five and six is here in, in, in the West. <clears throat> and um, with the, with the abandonment of DTT in, um, in Japan, uh, that freed up all that spectrum. The AM Broadcasters Association um, in Japan had requested to the government that they be given some, some spectrum in this freely in this free spec in this new recently released Spectrum, to extend the FM band and to be able to start migrating their AM stations over because the AM stations are costing too much to operate. And it would be, it would be more efficient to move these services to FM. And um, wide FM has grown in Japan, um, massively marketed. When I was there a few years ago, just seeing, you know, just seeing the huge display of wide FM radios in the stores, and you get and you you walk into a, a Best Buy here in America, and they're like, "What's a radio?" So, you know, a lot of a lot a lot of different attitudes and such, and um, but they have been expanding their stations. Um, no AM stations have gone off the air yet, um, as we mentioned there. Um, in the first six years, this was taken, this was a snapshot taken about three years ago. Um, they were already at 53%. I'm, I'm assuming they're much higher now in the um, penetration of uh, receivers. Just recently, Brazil has um, extended their FM band. <clears throat> uh, they are now using the Channel 6 spectrum, and they're doing an AM migration. Radios are being marketed. The government does have a mandate there. Auto manufacturers are including wide FM radios capable of tuning 76 to 108 in vehicle models. And, you know, when you combine and also to the, the new radios that are the, the wide FM radios sold in Japan are also full coverage 76 to 108 even though nothing above 95 is currently used for FM radio right now out there. The radios do go all the way to 108. And, you know, when you take the populations of Japan and Brazil and put them together, you get about the population of the United States. So right now, a, a population about the size of the United States currently has access to radios that tune 76 to 108. So for those people out there that say, oh, no, no one's going to get the radios. They don't sell them. Yada, yada. You know, they, they're, they're not available. They are available. You just, you know, they just have to be shipped here. They just have to be brought onto our shores. The rate, you know, right now, you know, I've seen graphics of hundreds of different models of wide FM radios from all the different um, uh, manufacturers you know, integrated into their infotainment systems um, and such. And, and that's, um, and, and that's, and that's pretty much, uh, you know, it, it's happening. 
the receivers are out there. They just need to find their way to our shores. They're already going to Brazil. They're already all over Japan. So there's no new designs that need to be made. I mean, come on, Brazil is a 10 kilohertz AM country. It's ITU region two. So we don't have to worry about, um, you know, making sure that the radio has the right steps for, a, you know, for the AM band and all that. We don't have to worry about that. It's already happening. Um, wide FM goes all the way to 108. Well, technically we're widening the band, but the area that we're focusing on is the 76 to 88 part of the band. So, um, and finally, uh, Cytel, which is kind of the, um, kind of like in the hierarchy, they're like, they're under the International Telecommunications Union, technically. They're the next level down. And uh, they deal with mainly um, IT region two issues that would be North and South and Central America. And because of the activities in Brazil, um, they have issued, one of their working groups has issue, has has approved a recommendation that um, IT, uh, that CITEL member states um, look at um, the possibility of extending sound broadcasting into the 76 to 88 megahertz band. Um, based on our research, it looks like Colombia is seriously interested in doing this. And I would not be surprised if more South American nations um, come, in, come on board. Mexico, we thought was going to abandon low band. Well, it's it's starting to come back again. New stations are being approved in Mexico um, in the channel two through six spectrum. Um, we believe we have one just south of uh, Arizona in Sonora. Um, and uh, that's a channel five station. That's uh, I don't know if it's on the air yet. It's not it hasn't been reported to the FCC or if it has, it's not in the LMS system yet. So um, our systems did not pick it up. But um, but, you know, it's there. It's supposedly there. So but bottom line is um, when you look at things. The, the the band is just not being used. Um, the FM band is not being used for primary purposes. It's all secondary stuff. And um, secondary can be displaced by primary. And uh, so, I mean, if we, if, we, if we were to look down, now if we look at the, the wide FM uh, proposal itself, you know, what we're doing is obviously we're, uh, you know, we've got, we've got some various um, objectives that we've got that we're working with was when I wrote this, these were the objectives. We we're going to use existing mass produced and tested technology, meaning analog FM, existing radios, radios that I can um, go to uh, to go to Yodobashi camera in, in Japan and pick up and actually use um, radios that are currently being sold in in uh, in uh, Brazil. Um, in addition, there's also radios out there. You know, there's a lot of talk that, you know, radios can be flash updated. You, know, you take it into the, uh, you take it into the dealer and they can, you know, so, um, you know, there, there, there are options even for some existing radios, not all of them, but some existing radios out there, but for a majority, for those who want to pick up wide FM, then um, they would need to get a new radio. Um, protecting the primary TV services, this is a big deal. This is a big one. Because when we went into this, we wanted to make sure that WPVI and all the other um, TV stations that have primary status in that spectrum um, are being represented and are, are being protected. I mean, obviously we'd like them to move, but not everybody has. And I was, I kind of got derailed <coughs> a little earlier on this. And I was talking about the reasons why uh, stations are staying on six. I mean, obviously the spectrum issue is the big one in Philly. Um, 
we're, we see uh, some of these stations are uh, public TV stations. The ones down in Georgia are. And I just don't think that they have the, the, the commercial motivation to move off of Channel 5. And they probably feel that their cable coverage and their satellite coverage is good enough. So they are not that fast to move off that spectrum, even though they probably have plenty of room on, on UHF to do so. And then the third case is where I think we have some rural viewers, especially with the uh, the cluster of uh, Channel 5s and 6s out in Kansas and Nebraska. Um, I just feel like, that. yeah, they've got their big antennas on their roofs and they just have it pointed there and they're able to watch uh, low band TV because they've got the big uh, Channel Master or Weingart antennas that are humongous and larger than life. Unlike these little things that look like little boxes that, you know, these little things that look like little square mouse pads that you hang on the wall that, you know, that, that we have for TV these days. Um, no forced migration of stations or listeners. We did not want Wide FM to be in a situation where um, listeners would, ha would be kicked off of what they've got right now. And this was kind of one of the big pushbacks with, uh, you know, the previous plans, including ones that I put forward that said, hey, why don't we migrate AM broadcast stations, especially the lowest power ones? Why don't we migrate those to FM, put them in 76 to 88? We've also seen a lot of folks come up with, you know, ideas like, oh, we'll do it. You know, we'll do digital DRM. Uh, we'll cut it down to 100 kilohertz wide digital signals, you know, try to fit more on the band. You know, you have um, 120 channels instead of 60 and, and just all these crazy pie in the sky ideas that involve new technology and and stuff that's it's not ready for prime time. And, um, you know, we don't we're not getting any kind of word from the NAB. That they want to see a an AM to FM full migration. I mean, they're still riding the whole translator uh, world. And translators are, you know, are not always the best, you know, not, not necessarily because they're power limited. It's because they're antenna limited in a lot of cases. The, the really successful um, translators for AM stations are in these rural towns where they're able to put up a 250 watt non-directional uh, signal. And, um, you know, that's all fine and dandy. But um, we want to make sure that, um, you know, that nobody is forced to, to move up to this band and they only buy the radios if they want the new services. A focus on uh, non-commercial educational services. Yes, this is what the FCC has cracked the door open on because... While a lot of us have talked in the past about, you know, extending AM into that spectrum, NPR comes through and says, look, let's let, let's put uh, let's extend the uh, non-commercial educational services and, you know, extend the 20 channel reserve band into channel six. I mean, that's what they originally came in the door asking. The problem is that if you extend just channel six and not channel five. You're going to miss out on the markets that need new FM, new diverse voices on FM the most. New York City. New York City is hungry for radio. I mean, I'm not justifying it, but think about all the pirate bus that we've been seeing lately and all the pirate letters that have been going out. Radio piracy is, um, is, is in some ways, I mean, it's illegal, it's unsafe, especially at some of the powers that some of these pirates operate in in, at New, in in New York. But it's also, for some ethnic groups and some underrepresented groups, it's a cry for help. It's saying, we want visibility. And current radio, especially when you look in the major markets, there hasn't been any openings for new stations in these markets, especially in the 20 reserve channels since uh, the days of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So, you know, a lot of groups and a lot of, a lot of demographics are currently underrepresented in our current stations that are mainly operated by universities. 
And, um, you know, they were originally run by universities for legitimate purposes, you know, to, for student training and, and public education. But as time went on, you know, these, these universities have veered away from radio and they basically pawned it off into a, into a public radio donation uh, underwriting based model that we have today. You know, there was a time, there was a time when, um, you know, college radio was college radio. Um, honestly, one of my, one of my first gigs outside the house was uh, doing some volunteering at uh, KCSN in Northridge back when they were a 6KW Class A. The uh, tower, the, the, the transmitting antenna was on campus. And the programming was mainly students and uh, other volunteers. And, you know, eventually they they took on sort of the public radio model and went corporate. And uh, they went to a B1, to a different site, wider coverage. But um, I, I, I won't forget the good old days um, at KCSN. Okay, focus on localism. Let's talk about localism for just a moment here. This is one thing that obviously uh, non-commercial radio is lacking, and especially with all the national owners, the um, Educational Media Foundations, American Family Associations, the Smile FMs, the CSNs, all these um, national owners that are coming in um, and, 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 and picking up all kinds of stations and such, and even the out-of-state interests the regional out-of-state interests that have come in in this in this 2021 window. Now, while there were uh, there was a significant number of grants so far to local applicants in the singletons, um, it's not going to be that way with um, the other with the point with uh, um, with the, at least uh, the fair distribution because um, the big buck the big bucks uh, organizations can can afford the big bucks to build the bigger facilities. One of the things that we're looking at here, and we'll be talking a little bit about the filing window for Wide FM if this ever was adopted, um, is that in the first filing window series, it's going to be what we call a filing window series. Uh, the, there's going to be a localism requirement pretty much any applicant that files in that first window set has got to be um, has got to qualify as a local applicant, not as an established local applicant, but just as a local applicant, a um, an entity whose headquarters or campus, or seventy five percent of their board members residing, are within twenty five miles of the reference coordinates for this community of license. That is considered local. That's considered local under the current NCE rules. Um, avoiding unnecessary displacement of LPA TV stations and translators. Now, um, obviously, with uh, with primary services coming in, we can't uh, guarantee that. You know, we're only, you know, we're only we're only estimating that half of the. LPTV stations in the five six uh, spectrum would be able to survive all this, and um, but the the thought here is that what we're going to do um, is um, what we're going to do here with the bands is that. Primary services will only be available in one channel spectrum area, what we call, or what we're going to call a band. We'll talk about the bands here in just a little bit. But, um, you know, if you're in an area where there's where channel six is not an issue, your, 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 your 20 NCE channels are going to be in the channel six spectrum. If you're in New York City where channel six is an issue because of Philadelphia, your 20 channels will be in the channel five spectrum. And then in some areas like Philadelphia or Washington, D.C., where channel five and channel six are um, stopping all the fun, there's not going to be any uh, full service availability. There will still be a, a low power ability, and we'll talk about that. But um, we're not going to we're not going to display we're not going to displace channel five and channel six in in basically the same area. Um, so, for example, in um, 
in New York City. Um, well, New York City is not a good example. Um, trying to think of one. Uh, Denver, I think, is an example of one. Uh, there is a Channel 5 low-power TV station. Uh, the area is um, primary stations will be on Channel 6. and But because of that low-power TV station being on 5, all the secondary FM stations will have to protect that low-power TV station. So that means Channel 5 would not be available in the Denver Metro for um, low-power FM stations, but they will have Spectrum available in 6. So um, it, it just won't be as abundant. And um, uh, let's see, what else? Um, addressing the Franken FM, FM6. What do we do with those 13 stations? Well, you know, one of the ideas being thrown around, you know, first of all, just as um, just as a point of order, REC supports the sunsetting of these stations that after um, that spectrum is needed for primary services, the, the Frank and FMs just disappear. They go. Once they're off of channel six, they're not going to be able to do FM services. They can move to another channel and be an LPTV station. But um they would have to move off of Channel 6. Uh, but in the meantime, until that period happens, let's keep these services going and let them continue to operate on their STAs until it's time to sunset. And um, so, you know, just some thoughts there. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, technical rules tried and tested. Of course, what we're what we're proposing. Um, this goes around mainly around how FM stations are going to protect TV stations. Now, TV stations are going to protect FM stations. Um, we're using um, we're using existing um, we're we're using existing processes, existing standards, both at the FCC and at the ITU level. And um, we'll just have to uh, take a look at that. Um, also, too, um, opening the door to creative uses of FM spectrum. Since we have <clears throat> ways of, um, you know, since we have, well, since we do have virgin spectrum that we could work with, you know, how about some, how about some new things? You know, we get a lot of requests for a lot of things around here. And there's been a couple of good requests in the past filed by others. Um, you know, there were other petitions for rulemaking that were filed around the time that LPFM was filed. And I think they were trying to ride the coattails of LPFM. And, uh, you know, we'll look at one of those. So that's pretty much uh, where we're at there. Um, Brian says, so much localism is diverted from uh, podcasting to um I mean, from radio to podcasting you know when is the wide fm opening you know well who knows it'd be up to the fcc to uh to do this now keep in mind one thing at least for pod you know, podcasting is a different story i mean podcasting it's like yeah you, know, you listen to a 30 minute show you're done um but you know one of the points that we made in um in the in our comments was in regards to the uh, the old uh, you know the old pushback that we get here all the time. Oh, people are not listening to the radio anymore. They're streaming. Um, not everybody is streaming. In fact, there is a whole entire there's a whole entire demographic set of people who can't stream. Why? Because they are dependent on. Um, universal service. They're dependent on the universal lifeline uh, service, the universal broadband. So in universal broadband, in the universal um, telephone service, you know, otherwise known by some as the infamous Obama phones, even though, you know, the services, lifeline service existed for many decades before Obama. Um, they, um, the, the service standards, uh, the minimum service standards that are um, that are that are set up for 
um, for these phones is that they're only allowed, um, you know, the minimum standards are three are three G data, which is slow in today's standards, and um, about and four gigs of uh, data transfer per month. And for somebody to be able to listen to a, a, a sustained radio uh, broadcast for eight or 10 hours a day, it's going to eat up all their data, especially with stations, including mine, um, that insist on streaming at 128K and, and, and you know, and higher bit rates. Um, yeah, it's going to eat up the data. And a lot of these, um, a lot of these phones just cannot handle it. So you know, not you know, not everybody is not everybody is privileged to uh, to 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 lease a Lexus every two years and have a an integrated infotainment system in their car that interfaces with their phone so they can hit the Spotify button on the dash and they're listening to music and they can skip whenever they want. Not everybody has those privileges. And a lot of people keep forgetting that is there are a lot of people out there that don't have the privilege of that. So um, let's see, you know, this is why I think radio is still the radio is still relevant for for many people. Radio is still relevant. Um, you know, Brian says, yeah, um, uh, elderly need radio as company and staying engaged. Yes. Um, a lot of people need radio and um people there's people out there that need radio that speaks their language and there's people who need uh radio that keeps them in touch with somewhere else other than uh between our two shores and not everybody is going to be um shelling out you know a hundred dollars a month for a, a verizon plan with unlimited data so yeah, radio is still relevant. All right, let's see. Um, trying to understand this uh, this comment here. We need fairness to many millions to many million dollars. Radio stations are not being fair to new or want to be a part of the bands. Um. Not getting where you're coming from um, with that, but um, have you seen any new any new open source frequency propagation tools, a la Soft Commander? Um, no, I haven't. I'm not necessarily familiar with uh, Soft Commander, but um, let's see. Um, well, I just um, Googled that. I'm not really seeing anything, so <clears throat> don't know what you're talking about. You know, okay, yeah, edging out the little guy, and that, and the, and you know something, and this is why we're, this is why we're looking at, um, oh, you mean FM Commander VSoft, um. You know that I can do a whole entire show on on um, on on propagation software. You know, you got VSoft, you've got um, ComStudy, um, RF Investigator is out there. That might be, you know, that's in the process right now of coming back. Yeah, yeah, VSoft. Yeah, their 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 FM search tool is called FM Commander, and their uh, their propagation and uh, tool is called uh, Probe. So, um, okay, I see where you're going with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is one thing about this uh, this window is if we keep all the uh, big national names out, at least in the first opportunity, you know, the small guy, the, the local organization, even the well-funded local organization is going to have a chance. And remember, we're only talking about non-commercial radio here. We're not talking about commercial radio. Commercial radio is not a part of the full service equation, with the exception of what to do with the Franken-FMs. Because what could happen with the Franken-FMs 
is, is our, our attitude is, is look, I want, you know, these stations should be sunsetted, but if you want to keep some kind of service to replace them, 87.7, make that a commercial allotment in the 13 markets where the Franken FMs currently are. And that way they're out of the way of the bands that we're proposing for, um, for what we want to do with uh, full service um, for 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 full service FM, um, you know, issues regarding um, equipment and such. Um, you know, the trans we think the transmitter manufacturers they're already making transmitters for Japan. They're already making them for Brazil. Um, Gates Air did uh, show a uh, wide FM capable FM transmitter at an NAB show a few years ago. Um, basically demonstrating for the Brazilian market. So they're there. Uh, antennas, easy. Any any channel 5, channel 6 antenna. Um, the antennas are already being made. Um, HD radio. Um, HD, I did have a conversation with Xperia during all this. And they do not foresee any issues um, with the ability to be able to run hybrid HD radio down there. Uh, they don't seem to be too concerned about the uh, interference to any interference to digital television, but considering that the hybrid signal uh, is operating at uh, 10 dB below carrier or 10% of the uh, power or less, um, you know, they they they're not seeing that as as any kind of an as, as any kind of an issue because that was one of the issues that I did bring up was the digital and the digital interference. Now, if they were to run digital only at a higher power. Yeah, then we may have some issues, but we're not talking, we're not, we're not, we're not at the point yet where we're um, proposing digital only FM radio. That's not a part of this. Um, RDS, uh, there are issues with RDS version one. There's no issues with RDS version two. RDS version one, the uh, the issue on RDS version one is the alternate frequency function that um, I don't think many stations are using. But it's a, it's a feature in RDS where you could set um, RDS, the RDS data stream, so that way it sends out the frequencies of other station of other stations that are carrying the same content. So that way, if somebody is driving into another area, the radio will automatically retune. Um, that capability only goes down to eighty seven point one. Um, from my understanding, RDS two addresses this. So um, so we've got that. And also, too, I've been in contact with all the major um, broadcast engineering software providers, uh, Vsoft, ComStudy, and um, there doesn't seem to be any issues with uh, rolling, out, um, rolling out software that would work um, in this spectrum. So, um, as you know, as we mentioned before, of course, we're we're also including Channel Five. That was not part of the NPR proposal or the NPR concept. NPR has not passed through a formal proposal unless they've done it within the past uh, twelve hours, and I have not because I have not looked at ECFS um, this morning and to see if they've loaded up any new comments in there. But uh, NPR wasn't there as of um, about seven or eight o'clock last night. Um, the, um, so that, you know, so we're looking at, we're looking at 60 channels instead of 30, like NPR wants. And to me, it makes sense because the radios are already out there. Some of the markets can't get channel six, but they can get channel five. So, you know, why don't we, you know, so why don't we do it that way? So the, the question of course now is, is how do, um, how do radio stations protect TV stations on the same channel? Well, actually, they do it the same way that analog TV stations protect digital TV stations on the same channel. And uh, this is basically what we had proposed um, is, you know, each television station, the ones in the low band VHF, they have what's called a noise limited contour. And then they have a um, 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 they have the equivalent of their grade B or their service contour and the equivalent of their grade A or city grade contour. There, the one we're concerned about is the outermost contour, the noise limited contour, and that would be a 28 uh, dB uh, noise limited contour, and that is using what's called the 5090 
the 5090 uh, curves, which means that a that those those predictions are based on 50% of the receivers 90% of the time normally fm radio is 50 50 50% of the receivers 50% of the time but digital you've got to have that solid signal in there and so they use the 50 90 um and um it's obviously a smaller uh area but it pretty much it pretty much matches up and actually goes further than the old 47 dB 5050 that we had with uh, with uh, VHF low band television in the analog days. <clears throat> so what uh, what we use in um, analog to digital protection standards is what's called a 2 dB DU ratio or d- a desired to undesired ratio. So that means that you're that your uh, desired signal has to be at least uh, two dB over, um, you know, over the undesired signal, and in this case, um, you have um, what we have is is what we're using is is the for the FM facility is we are using the twenty six dB interfering contour. Now, those of you who know radio may know that, like for co-channel FM. Um, in the case of a 60, you know, in case of zone two, in the case of a 60 dB station, we use the 40 dB interfering contour. Well, this goes all the way out to 28 because that would make the 2 dB ratio. And that's actually a pretty far distance. You know, the map on the left shows full service protections. And it basically shows how um, a uh, a full service uh uh, you know that shows a what what a typical full service wide FM station would look like on the same channel as a TV station, and um, in full service we have to do um, we have to do both ways on protection. So we have to do um, protection outward, so the uh, full service FM station doesn't receive interference, and of course, so the full service TV station doesn't receive interference. So um, it, it's and this is no different than on FM, on on commercial FM, and and on full service non-commercial. It's the same way. Um, interference protections are both ways. Now for uh, LPFMs and secondary services, on the on the example on the right, we can come inside the interfering contours of TV stations and uh, come right up to their um, right up to their noise limited contour. That's pretty much how that example works. So that is the basics. Um, in the proposal, we've uh, we've st- uh, stated that if a um, if an NCE station is located within 400 kilometers of a full service TV station on the same channel in the same band, um, that they have to do with contour study. Or in the case of uh, L- in the case of LPFM, the distances are shorter, it's like 200 and something where they have to show a contour study. Otherwise, it'll be simple. You know, they just can't do it. Um, will there be, oops, hang on, let me get the right thing here. Will there be a uh, digital prerequisite requirement to play on wide FM? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm trying to veer away from that. I'm trying to use existing What's out there now? I know I'm, I know hybrid, but um, I am not for digital mandates. Uh, I'm not for them in uh, you know as much as I would love to see them in receivers. I would love to see the 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 industry step up and finally start selling more HD uh, receivers standard instead of making it some kind of a luxury item. That's the problem. That was the problem with car manufacturers in the early days was they considered it a luxury option while some had it standard. And uh, to me, that was a huge mistake by the auto industry. The auto industry really boffed up the the launch of HD radio. They could have done so much more. And this was even before all the influences by the uh, the streaming providers for competition on the dash. They could have done better. They could have done much, much, much better. So, um, you know, we talked about um, the areas that um, 
you know, wide FM would be available. This is a map of this is a map of the United States, obviously, um, but it is. It also shows you the um, the areas just outside the 26 dB um, interfering contours of the TV stations on channels five and six. Now we call those areas um, we call those areas exclusion zones. We basically go about 5.6 kilometers past the 26 dB interfering contour. We use 5.6 because that's a minimum class A facilities service contour size, 5.6, basically the same as LPFM. And so area one, which is most of the country, is area where uh, channel six would be used for the 20 full service NCE channels. Um, the red areas are areas where channel six is an issue, but channel five isn't. And those areas will have um, Channel 5 for their full service stations. And then the bad news, Area 3. Area 3 are the areas in yellow on that map. And those are the areas where Channel 5 and Channel 6 both conflict. And unless those, until a time that those stations go away, there's not much we can do in those cases. Now, that's leaving out Philadelphia. That's leaving out Baltimore, Washington, Atlanta. Um, there's a few major markets in there that won't be able to get um, full service radio. Again, using that uh, previous graphic I showed, LPFM may be possible. In some cases, they may have to do a directional antennas, which can be very costly for LPFMs because of the proof of performance uh, requirements. But uh those are, you know, those, 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 that's what's available. That's what we're looking at. And we talked about bands. I'll talk about bands here really quickly here. Band five is the 30 channels from 76.1 to 81.9. That's also channel five. <laughs> um, band six is the 30 channels from 82.1 to 87.9. So basically what we're doing is we're treating the different, um, the different bands, um, we're treating the, these two as separate entities because in some areas, band five will not be available for things. In some areas, band six will not be available. We're treating these two totally independent and they're all based on what their current uh, TV situation is. And again, uh, full service stations only have to protect full service TV stations, uh, LPFMs, translators, and other services that we're going to talk about. Um, are going to have to protect both primary and secondary TV facilities. So all the TV translators and LPTVs out there. Now keep in mind that if a TV that if an LPFM station is running in the same band as a full as as where full service is available, full the full service station being there has done that LPFM a favor because the full service station has caused the low power TV station on that channel to be displaced. All it takes is one FM signal, and boom, that, that LPTV station would have to be displaced. And that's how we open the bands. And um, so within the bands, um, well, there's a, there's a big wide area. Uh, look at the bands, um, you know, in each area. So you'll see how this works. If, it's in, if you're in area one, the green is your, LP, is your uh, full service. And um, the blue is the LP, we are setting aside LPFM channels. So LPFM channels are being set aside. There'll be uh, eight in each band. Technically, 87.7, which is shown in purple, is LPFM, except if the FCC wants to launch uh, the 13 uh, Franken FMs. And if that's the case, then that channel would be um, considered commercial. Um, and then we're going to talk about something here in just a bit called ELP. And you'll see that there's two channels at the bottom of each band that are dedicated for that. Um, LPFM stations will have access to the blue. They'll also have access to the red. The red will be um, used for um, various ser secondary services, LPFM and translators. And we're going to talk about translators because we're doing something really neat that the, that's going to completely piss off the translator community. But we're but we've proposed it. We put it out there, 
if anything, just to make a statement. Um, also, you see the references to foreign priority, U.S. priority. That has to do with border sharing. I'm not going to get into too much detail on border sharing, but the bottom line is, is along the borders, on each band, um, foreign stations have, you know, if, if foreign stations want to start doing this too, if Mexico and Canada want to start doing this, foreign stations will have, uh, will have priority in the lower part of the band. U.S. will have priority in the higher part of the band. That's basically all that's, that's, that's all that foreign priority stuff is all about there. So just some things to, um, just some things to think about there. Um, filing windows for the, for the full power non-commercial now. For full power non-commercial, we have virgin spectrum here. The problem with, the problem with the current structure of how we do filing windows for NCE is that it assumes that the spectrum is already crowded and you're trying to get little nooks and crannies of what's left. And you can choose any channel you want in the band as long as you meet um, the distances. Um, remind me of areas one, two, and three. Okay, area one is an area where channel six is not an issue. Channel 6 TV stations are not an issue. Um, it's a majority of the country. And that's where the that's where full power stations will be in band 6 or the channel 6 TV spectrum. Area 2 is areas that are inside of an exclusion zone or an area where channel 6 is going to be an issue, a channel 6 exclusion zone. But channel 5 is okay. So the full power... Non-commercial stations will be in band five or the channel five spectrum. And then area three is where an area is within both exclusion zones, both five and six. So there's no full service. There may be LPFM, but no full service in those areas. So that's, that's basically it. So one is six, two is five, three is none. So that, that's probably a, a, a good way to remember that. But anyway, back on the issue on the uh, filing windows. Um, right now, if we were to use this current process right now where you could, anybody could file for any, for any channel in the area and you have wide open spectrum, you're going to get lot markets like Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, where it's going to be a complete zoo and you're going to have, you're going to have prop, you're going to have proposals all over the 20 channels. And with the commission's one grant policy, if all those, if all those applications are, conflicting with each other, then all of a sudden you've got um, one big giant MX group in Los Angeles. And you know how many grants they put out of an MX group normally? One. One full-time grant is all they get. One grant policy. FCC just upheld it the other day in a, in a letter decision. Um, it's not going to work. The, the, the current rules will not work for wide open spectrum. The only way to fairly do wide open spectrum and in a manner that is consistent with the uh, fair distribution um, language in the Communications Act is to start the service with an initial table of allotments. Now, a few people I've talked to about the allotments, they've kind of they kind of poo pooed the idea. And, um, but I think to start, to start the process, to get things going, we need some organization to the chaos. So we had a computer program made that would go out and we ranked every single um, census designated community based on their 2010 gazetteer populations, because that's the only data that's, uh, that's been published on at that level. Um, we took their 2010 data, ran it in reverse order. So we started with New York City, ended with a small town in Alaska, anything that was over 1,000 population. And using the 73, using a modified version of the 73207 distance separation rules for commercial radio, we assigned allotments to each station to each uh, community, and we tried to fit them in there. We took the uh, intermediate frequencies and other things into consideration. 
We also took the border priority stuff that I was talking about into consideration. And we established, we built a table of allotments for, um, with 3,501, 3,501 was what the total number came out with. Some communities got two allotments because we went through the whole list. And then we went through again and there was still communities where we could fit a second one in. So we put the second one in. Um, and it came out to uh, th- 3,501. And so each community, um, you know, you know, and then the allotments, the, the service classes on the allotments were based on um, what, um, you know, the size of the community. So bigger communities, we started with C2. And actually, let's, let's, let's quickly talk about service classes really quickly since we've gotten on that subject. Um, big change in service classes for both um, full service and LPFM. Big changes. Full service for wide FM, we're only proposing A, C3, and C2. So this means that there'll be no zone one, zone 1A, zone two, none of that nonsense. The whole entire country is zone two. So this means no Bs, no B1s. And we're also looking at a maximum 50 kW facility. Because remember, we want these stations to be more localized than super regional. We've already got plenty of... 100 kW blow torches right now in the reserve band. We really don't need any more. So 50 kW is the top. So that means no C1, no C0, no Cs. Now look at what we did with uh, with LPFM. What we did with LPFM was we created a local, we created an LCRA zone, a local community radio act zone, in the LPFM and and uh, FM translator space. We are taking the literal letter of the law. It says that FM translators and LPFM stations are secondary in status and must and must remain equal in status. Well, this is as equal as you can get in the spectrum for the wide FM, not for the not for the existing 88 to 108 legacy band, but for the low end for for the for the world south of 88. LPFM and FM translators will have the same exact technical models. And we will have an LP100 like we have today. We'll have an LP250 like what was proposed in Simple 250. And we're also going to have a third class called LPFM, LP250+. And that is the equivalent of the FCC rules that exist right now for non-fill-in translators west of the Mississippi River that can basically operate up to 250 watts at 107 meters above average terrain. We're not using the maximum height above average terrains like uh, like FM translators do. We're using just traditional uh, LPFM style of um, height above average terrain. But um, to me, this is this will bring LPFM and FM translators on a level playing field, at least below 88. And it, and it screams fairness. Um, also, too, the other issue that we're looking at on this, we don't have a slide for it, but is the community need aspect of, um, of translators. And, um, you know, the LPFM, the LCRA says that, L, that LPFMs and translator licenses are, are based on community need. Well, the following, the community needs that have been um, identified is... Um, any, any, uh, FM trans, any translator that's rebroadcasting the HD one or analog station of, you know, part of any, uh, FM or AM broadcast station, we're going to include both AM and FM. Um, I don't have a, I don't have, you know, to me, there is a public interest and a public need, um, a community need for, um, AM translators. So, you know, if we can fill up some of that spare spectrum. In like channel five in a lot of areas with a couple eight, with a few AM translators, you know that might be the the closest thing we could have to an an F you know to an AM uh, uh, revitalization kind of thing. Of course, we're not proposing primary service. Translators can't be primary. Now, if the NAB was to come back and someday and say, "Look, we want primary status," um, and we're willing to displace all the remaining channel five and channel six stations, 
Okay, great. There's spectrum to do it. There is spectrum to do it. So, might step on some secondary toes along the way, but there is spectrum to do it. So that's basically what we had proposed um, for that. Also, too, um, the use of translators to rebroadcast um, any uh, uh, non-commercial, non-fill-in, um, any primary station that is the longer of either uh, 200 miles away or the same state. Um, in other words, we don't want satellites down there. We're looking at only services that meet community need. So, um, you know, the the infamous uh, FM the F infamous FM translator in Key West, Florida for Calvary Chapel of Twin Falls, Idaho is not going to happen. That is just not not going to happen. But anyway, in the window itself, in the filing window, so we're, we're setting up these allotments. So basically, you have a community of license assigned to you. You have a community of license that's assigned. You have a channel, and you have a class. Your request, your application, must meet those requirements. You have to specify the same city, the same channel, and either the service class that's uh, or an inferior service class. So if it's a C2 allotment, you can request a C3 or an A. You won't be in an advantage with the other applicants because technical points come into play and such. Um, but what does not come into play in this is going to be the fair distribution threshold analysis. Why? Because everybody in the same MX group and the same allotment group is requesting the same city. So you have no cities to compare. So we don't do threshold fair distribution. There will be, uh, we did write in some tribal priority uh, related stuff where tribes could request an allotment added or they could file outside the allotments as long as they protect the allotments. Um, that's how we're dealing with um, tribal priority. Now, the, 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 the one goofy thing that we had to do in the initial window was, had to do with the actual proposals for, the, for these window filed applications. Because what we did not want to see happen was we did not want to see um, situations where two applicants, two applications in different communities would be mutually exclusive with each other, even though they even though they meet the distances under the distance separation for the for the assignment of the allotments, because of terrain and other issues, they do have some kind of overlapping contours. So what we're saying is, is in the initial window, you have to file, uh, you have to first specify a directional facility that keeps your um, your service contour, your 54 and your 40 dB interfering contours within specific radii. And then, as you can see on the picture on the right, once everything is granted, all those restraints come off, and yep, you can expand out to a full facility. So that's kind of how we're looking at it for, um, for wide FM. Um, because there's 3,500 applications, what we're looking at is is we're looking at at least we're, we're looking at one filing window for the, for all the channel five or band five applications. Those can be easily handled in one window. I think there's like about three hundred and fifty or four hundred allotments or so in band five. All the remainders are in band six. And what we would do is is we would go by service class and then by population. And um, we got it spread out to about the 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 proposal. Um. The proposal was spread out is is um, about is six windows, six what we're calling uh, what we're calling stages. So stage one is is band five, everybody. Then stage six will be all your C twos, all um, most of your C threes and some A's. It's going to be based on population first, and then by and then eventually it's going to go down. And yeah, it will put some of the applicants up in the uh, early stages at a little bit of an advantage. There's nothing we can do about that um, without keeping the constraints on any longer. We don't want actually people having to build on the constraints. We would rather have the constraints in play 
as long as it's necessary, and then allow them to pull out, modify, and and actually do their facility. Another the other option we're looking at is short form, just doing a short form application. The problem with short form is is that you don't have the up, you don't necessarily have the upfront site assurance information upfront, where we just can't say okay, these groups are filing for the Los Angeles allotment. You also don't have a technical facility um, necessarily. Um, I mean, you do kind of on a short form. You could do it that way. But what we want is, is we want a technical facility on there. Um, even if it's, and, and, and the facility that they would be competing with is the one that's within the, with, it's within the constraints. So um, point system would be about the same. We are going to make a couple changes. Um, first thing we're proposing is to get rid of the statewide network points for radio. Statewide network, um, you see those two points you see on the, um, is a relic from the 1940s, 1950s, back when non-commercial stations were used to deliver um, instructional programming to classrooms for within the same school system as the licensee of the station. Um, TV station, non-commercial TV stations have been doing that up until like the 80s, uh, KLCS in Los Angeles was doing it into the 80s. Um, but um, radio just has not been doing that. So we're going to get rid of those, we're going to get rid of the statewide network points. What we're going to replace it with is we're going to replace it with an additional point added to the um, established local applicant. So a local established local applicant would go to four points and we would add a single point for 100% community coverage. So if you're proposing a station that puts a 60 dB over 100% of the community of license, um, you get an extra point. Normally, uh, NCE only requires a 50%, but we're giving that extra bonus if it's 100%. And those are really the only significant changes. Technical points will still stay the same. Tiebreakers will still stay the same. And of course, as we mentioned, there won't be any fair distribution analysis up front. So that's um, that's kind of where we um, where we stand with that. So um, let's see. Um, we've got that covered. We've got LPFM covered. Um, let's see. D -d 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 -d. Okay, questions. Let's let's go to the chat really quickly. Asking about what software generates the images. Well, this soft this these images came from the REC Contour Plotter which is an internal tool that's provided here at REC that I use. And I use this tool mainly for, mainly for presentations. I don't normally use it for actual measurements for uh, working on folks, but I do use it for presentations. And it allows me to, uh, you know, to, to put in a facility, drop in any kind of contour I want. Um, supports all the, it, it supports uh, FM, it supports uh, TV. Um, it has um, very limited support for AM, but it, but if I have a, uh, a two millivolt uh, pattern on file, it'll, it'll overlay it. And, um, and then, and of course it will draw radial circles as you can see on the left there. So that's pretty much um, how that tool works. And of course, as you can see, I can I can make hypothetical stations and drop them in. But yeah, that that is an internal tool that's not available to the public. Um, I don't consider it stable enough to offer to the general public. And right now, unless I can get some fantastic Windows UI programming skills in overnight. Um, I'm not planning on offering any kind of software to the general public. Um, that tool is a web-based tool. Um, <clears throat> do you upload your contour patterns from the FCC? Okay, that's an ELMS question, actually. Um, but um, the way ELMS, ELMS is the system that we use to, um, whenever an application is filed with the FCC, Within 15 or 20 minutes of it being filed, um, we have a program that goes out and looks at the uh, LMS public view, to see if there's any new applications there. If so, then we go grab a copy of the application. We parse the information on that application. And then one of the programs in there will actually go out 
get the height above average terrain information for all 360 radials from that site. And then based on that, we'll build a contour map. Uh, we'll build the contour map data. We'll build 360 uh, geo points, 360 latitudes, 360 longitudes, save all that data. And um, that's, what, uh, that's what makes the maps. And sometimes we have, we have to go out to an FCC API to get the maps. Some of our uh, software uh, still uses the FCC's API, which can be very slow sometimes. So sometimes if you get a slow map off of uh, FCC data, that's why. So, um, so yeah, we've got that. Um, yeah. The educational part of educational TV really proved its worth during the pandemic. Oh, wait. No, it didn't. Uh, let's see. Let me also add that I am not a fan of FM translators for AM, but let them move their operations to the uh, new spectrum and let their AMs go. Well, that's only if the FCC would ever um, uh, consider a primary service for AM down there. And um, right now, the NAB, which has a huge conflict of interest because they represent both TV and radio interests, unlike the other countries where the broadcast associations are separate for radio and TV, um, they don't have those conflicts. You know, so um, that is uh, pretty much that. How many more station, AM stations have gone digital? None that I'm aware of. We had a little bit, you know, we had a couple of them go digital, and then, then that's it. Um, I have not seen any digital notifications filed recently for AM stations. Um, one of the other services that um, we're proposing, we're throwing the idea out there. We're not saying that you guys, you know, that the FCC wants, should do it. But um, a couple things. First of all, let me touch on one issue. One of the biggest requests that we've had for expansion is the ability for license-free broadcasting and the ability to run, basically following the um, uh, the New Zealand model, maybe a small one watt transmitter station, um, being able to broadcast at those kinds of powers on dedicated frequencies. If we were clearing out both channel five and channel six for primary services, this could be done. However, we're not. And we're only pulling out the secondary services if they're in a situation where there's a primary service that's also causing issues, you know, where the primary bands are, you know, for being want to be used for FM. So there is no place to put um, unlicensed broadcast services at a higher power. And when I say higher, I mean higher than the 250 millivolts at three meters of the current uh, or 250 microvolts at three meters of the current Part 15 rule. Um, also, too, we did write in the um, in the proposed rules, we did include a Part 15 update, um, basically stating that um, the Part 15 FM rules would apply to 76 to 108. However, in the 76 to 88 band, because there's already another rule that prohibits this um, in areas that are inside the, uh, the uh, noise-limited contours of channel channel 5 or channel 6 TV stations, no fundamental emissions allowed. Now, of course, they won't be able to really enforce that. Um, but um, the problem is, again, is that in order for us to be able to do an unlicensed service in that spectrum, there's no way to enforce it. There's nothing stopping somebody, let's say we were to say 76.1 was a designated channel for license-free operation. And um, suddenly, you know, somebody turns on a 76.1 transmitter and now they're interfering with a Channel 5 low-power TV station. Well, that low-power TV station has priority. Uh, or they turn it on in an area where there's a Channel 5 full-power TV station. There's no way to control it. You know, the way they do it with the white space devices that are out that use the TV spectrum is it actually goes out to a database and pulls that. Do you see Hamilton Rangemaster or Shea Radio or any of the Part 15 manufacturers or a Decade or, or Ramsey or anybody coming out with an FM transmitter that, that includes 
a um, a fail safe system that calls out to the white space database and then has functionality in there to prevent it from being overridden. I don't see that happening. So no, we are not proposing um, unlicensed uh, service at this time. Again, if we were clearing out, completely clearing out all five and six, if everybody was gone, if all the primary users were gone, yeah, I would seriously look at it, but can't do it right now. The spectrum is not clear for that. What we are looking at, though, is another request that's come in quite often to REC. And that is the use of um, temporary radio stations for special events. Um, you know, for things like music festivals, the scouting jamborees, actually the, the national BSA, the National Boy Scouts of America, or Scouting USA, I think they're called now, um, in the past has gotten STAs to run FM transmitters at their jamborees in what is it, West Virginia or somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. Um, they've been get they've they've been they've had them in the past. Um, they're now the light. I think they're now the licensee of an LPFM station. Um, so the um, so the idea is to allow stations to do that, you know, to to be to allow organizers to set up little small radio stations for entertainment and public information and public safety. The other idea that we or that we're looking at is um basically rehashing uh, re, re, re resurrecting, that's the word I meant to say, resurrecting a proposal that was filed back in about 1999 by the National Hockey League. National Hockey League wants to see the ability to use extreme low power transmitters inside of sports stadiums to provide um, entertainment information and public safety to fans in attendance. And, um, you know, I think that I, I you know, I, I was actually supporting that back then. Um, in these past few, in this past decade, um, there is a company called Live Sports Radio. And what they do is they contract with sporting events and other various events. You, you see them a lot doing the golf tournaments and the, the tennis opens and stuff like that. And what they do is they file for an experimental authority, temporary authority on, an, on a TV channel, either in the low or high band. And then what they'll do is, is they, when, when you're at the event, you get one of their little radios. Now, what Live Sports Radio has said on their applications and what I've been hearing and what, how they're really operating are two totally different things. They claim that they're running an analog TV uh, facility. Now, these days, they're saying that they're running a, a hybrid uh, ATSC3, Franken-FM kind of, you know, with an analog there. But from my, from my understanding, all they're doing is they're running separate FM transmitters on different channels. So they'll have like four or five channels and they may run like, for example, one channel might be the play by play, uh, for, from the local station. The other one might be the play by play from the away station. Um, there might be like a Spanish simulcast and, and other things on there. And then, you know, of course, you know, they claim, Oh, so people can hear public address announcements better and such like that, which, which is, which is true laudable. And if they do it, that's great. So what we're looking at doing is is establishing a, a, a radio service that would allow for those for those extremely low power uh, facilities to be used on a seasonal basis um, by in, inside the, inside the confines of stadiums. Um, so we've added that to the proposal. So and we call it ELP. We call it all ELP, extremely low power. We have low power, and now we have extremely low power. So the single event permits. Um, are for the music festivals and the jamborees and the religious retreats and the conventions and such. And basically what we're saying is, is that if, um, if an, if an, if an event is expected to have a, a simultaneous attendance of at least 5,000 people, then it could qualify. And, you know, where we see this the best is in, on, in festivals and the scouting where camping is involved because those radio stations can be on the air to give emergency and other information or keep people entertained while they're in camp. Some things to think about. 
Um, the seasonal stadium requirements, um, 15,000 minimum. So that means mo you know, some of your um, higher end college and, and pro will be in there. Um, 15,000 is below the threshold for, um, you know, is, 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 you know, would cover all the NHL facilities. Some of them are in the, um, below 20,000. Um, but what it's not going to cover is your high schools. That's not intended. Um, 10 Watts set aside channel 76, one 76, three. 82.1, 82.3 in each band. Of course, they still have to protect the Channel 5 stations. They're going to be overprotecting the other um, uh, full-service stations if they use other channels. Um, we are putting in a small amount of buffer zone, kind of like LPFM. They can use any channel except for the 20 channels if it's reserved in the area for non-commercial. We're also, and it's not noted on the slide, but we're also restricting them from 87.5, 87.7, and 87.9. And we are doing that mainly just because of the adjacent channel relationships with the legacy FM band. Um, one thing, if you, if you remember from the original slide that we showed uh, the band plans, um, you'll see that, um, like, oh, no, that's not the one I want. Is it this one? There it is. Um, you'll see that, um, you know, we put the NCE bands in the middle of the channel, in the middle of the TV channel, not at the edge. Like, you know, st you know, basically we did not extend the band from 88.1 to 87.9, 87.7 and down. We didn't do that. We put them there for a reason. And that's mainly because they don't conflict with the legacy FM band from a spacing perspective. So that way we have 20 channels. We're all, the only thing we're constrained by is inter, is intermediate frequency, the the channels 10.6 or 10 point megs, 8 megs up that are in close proximity. But the reason why we did that was to keep some space between the legacy band and the new band and to be able to use those 20 channels to our fullest. And so yes, there's there's a there's a reason behind the madness. So with that, um oops, let me find the right Thing to click here. Um, I think we've covered a lot of what um, we wanted to cover here, of course. So uh, we'll leave it open for uh, any questions um, and such. But um, uh, when you get a chance to, check out y-fm.com as soon as it wants to come up here. There it is y-fm.com. That is the information website for, um, for Wide FM. And um, on there you can find uh, information about, um, about the service. We, uh, we address specific uh, items in the different, um, in the different uh, markets and different uh, uh, segments, I should say, of potential wide FM users. Um, we get into some information um, in regards to um, potential allotments in cities. Um, you know, like if we look at, um, let's, you know, let's look at New York City. Um, if we look at New York City, um, it's going to tell us, yeah, you've got, um, you know, you got five allotments in the, in, in the general area there. There's five uh, C2 allotments um, yeah, they're all different cities in New York, in New York and New Jersey, mostly New Jersey. That'll make the New Jersey Broadcasters Association happy. But those are all, um, most of those channels, I know New York, Newark, and I think Jersey City have capability from uh, um, Empire State Building. So they could be a full Empire State Building uh, FM station. Um, stations in New York, um, would have if they're running from Empire or they're running from one of the big sites, they would have to run a directional, um, and the directional would be to protect the Channel Five stations in Boston and Dover, Delaware. So some some interesting stuff there. So we've got that information there, and up in the corner, if you click on the location check, you can get information about. Um, 
you can get information about uh, your your own local area and what and what um, and what allotments are available there. Um, information regarding the uh, a copy of the um, of the of the filing with the FCC that is available both on the electronic comments uh, filing system. It's also available at recnet.com slash widefm. Uh, there's another more technical, um, less demystifying tool that you can use there to look for allotments. And we also have set up there right now is we did a simulation. And we were to say, okay, we've got all these allotments in here. Now, what would happen if we just started dropping in LPFM stations everywhere? So we did the same thing we did with allotments. We we got a list. We got one of our lists. It's the uh, Census Bureau zip code tabulation area list, which is census data down to many zip codes. And we did the same thing. We did rank order reverse zip code. And we just started going down and just started dropping in um, hypothetical LPFM stations. And then we did a second run to try to upgrade them to LP250. And then we did a third run to try to upgrade some of them to LP250+. plus. So it was a it was a neat little exercise. And if you want to see those on there, you'll be able to do that. Eventually, the other tool will be able to show you what a hypothetical FM6 band could look like or a hypothetical wide FM band could look like. So um, we'll see what happens um, for planning. When you would when would you like to do this again on YouTube? Good question. It it took a lot to drag me to do this one. Just because of everything going on, and then I'm having, I'm having software dying at the last minute. I'm having uh, op uh, computers dying at the last minute. I had to put this together, kind of as an emergency repair. Um, when things start to settle down, and we're not as much in this uh, regulatory fire drill that we're in right now, and we don't have. Um, issues with um, a lot of things. And as soon as I'm able to call everybody back, everybody who I've been um, unintentionally ghosting these past few weeks to get back with things, then yeah, then we can start looking at doing, doing more content again. Um, you know, we may come back, we may come back for a uh, reply comment day on this one to talk about, you know, what people had said and what we had to say about it. But I would like to get back to doing, um, not necessarily the pre-produced stuff, but at least doing the live stuff like this. Um, I do like to sit down. I do miss con I do miss chatting with constituents, and because you know I listen to you when these things come up, I listen to you, and uh, you know when I need when I need input, I put out a survey. So um, I appreciate that. Appreciate the comments about the site being awesome. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, you can try putting your zip code in it. It should work. Just go ahead and, you know, but anyway, um, I think for right now, I think we'll go ahead and call it. Um, I think we're done for this time around. And of course, um, any questions? We don't have a... We don't have any dedicated uh, social media pages set up for White FM. That's just too much to maintain. Um, the website will be the place, um, and White FM will be discussed at the REC Networks. Um, let me get rid of this. The, uh, the, it'll be discussed at the REC Networks um, page on Facebook, which will be coming around here on this little rotator cuff here in just a moment. Um, but yeah. So that's where we're at. So again, to everybody out there, I apologize for not being there all the time. I apologize for not having any YouTube content for a while. But unfortunately, there were a lot of things that unfortunately had to take priority. And um, YouTube is kind of more down towards the last of the list, but I did want to get this one out. So that way we have something on the documented record of what of what the Michi's mindset was I mean, you know, months from now or days from now, when people are reading maybe a Radio World article about this, they're going to be saying, "What the hell was she thinking?" Yeah, you know. Uh, gave up Facebook for Lent. Well, 
Um, don't give up the REC Network's website, recnet.com. With that, we stay, we say, we don't stay because we got to go. But we say, stay safe. And, you know, always look out for number one. Don't step in number two.